welcome to um, Lumi Hospital webinar series. Um, sorry for the logistic, uh, whatever at the beginning, but uh, we can see that you are all in now. Our topic for today is um, basic optic ultrasound techniques and pitfalls. I'll be presenting it from the Limi Hospital, which is a branch of the Limi Hospital groups, which include Limi Hospital, Cardio Care, and the Limi Children's Hospital. Um, I'm Dr. Iseko Kingsley. I'm a consultant radiologist at the Limi Hospital. You are welcome. So the question, why do we need to know about basic obstetric scan is because it is actually an emergency. Maternal health statistics for Nigeria is extremely poor. Maternal mortality ratio is about 840 per 100,000 live births uh, from the 2008 WHO report. And India and Nigeria account for 34% of global maternal deaths alone. Um, the lifetime risk of a Nigerian woman dying during pregnancy, childbirth, postpartum or post-abortion is one in 22. If you contrast it to developing countries, their lifetime risk is one in 4,900. Um, here, that's the link from WHO showing that. And the last uh, um, study in 2018 put our maternal mortality ratio at around 915. So the statistics have not changed much. So it is essential that each and every one of us in the health team knows the basic of obstetric care in case the trained person is not around and you need to make an urgent decision. So um, the outline for this presentation is we talk about some basic physics, scanning techniques, first trimester, second and third trimester scans, and the conclusion. Beside me is Dr. S. Uh, amen. Now, what is diagnostic ultrasound? Sound actually is as a result of mechanical energy that produces alternative compressions and refractions as it travels as a wave through a medium. It is actually a longitudinal wave. And um, what it does is that um, it needs a medium to propagate, unlike uh, what you have in electromagnetic waves. Now, the normal human hearing frequencies, one is 20 to 20 kilohertz. So what you hear, understand by ultrasound, it is ultra means higher than the normal human hearing frequency. And for diagnostic ultrasound, we use a range of one to 20 megahertz, which is um, much more than the 20 kilohertz. But for some therapeutic things, they even use higher range frequencies than what we have. So the sound pulses are transmitted into the body. They can be reflected, scattered, refracted, or absorbed. So a transducer is what we use to, to do our scan. And um, here I have uh, with me a covilinear transducer, as you can see here. So you can see it's covilinear. And you can see this is the, the point we're going to use for our marking. The power output is in decibels, and on the ultrasound machine, you have the gain, which affects the overall brightness, and the time gain composition, which affects the brightness in different zones of the scan. Then you have what you call the focal zone, where the maximum point of sound transmission, where you can focus to get a brighter and clearer image. And you can alternate what they call the depth to increase or decrease your field of view. Now, this is a picture showing the scan position. The guest should be lying flat on her back. And then uh, that's the monitor screen there, and that's you there. Now, if you are doing a scan, it, it, it's preferable to hold like this, hold it like this, and use it to scan so that you have control of your machine. This is just, I was mentioning before about the time gain compensation, which is on this side, where you, as the sound waves are going in, the attenuation occurs into the body. So we shift the lower ones a bit more to the right to increase the output to make the images coming from deeper structures brighter. 
and this is your screen and on the left hand side if you can look you can see the different aspects that are involved in scanning you can see the frequency we're using on this picture is 2.5 megahertz the covilinear does frequencies of three of two to seven and you could have a transvaginal endocavitary probe that can do even higher frequencies but they have limited depth depth of uh, view so the, if you use a transvaginal scan you can see maybe to a depth of like 8 cm you cannot see that far and what is used in specific cases in first trimester scan so um the brightness gain is that here, yeah, which is the overall gain. And so now, when you are using your transducer, what is important? The critical thing is that how do you know the correct position and the orientation of the monitor? You just bring your probe and look at this. Dr. Essen, you can look at this, right? Yeah. You can see the point here. This point, there's a point on the probe which shows which side is the right side up. Why it is important is because the right side up is your superior, why this is your inferior portion. And that is going to show on the screen when you're in the longitudinal view. Now, if you turn it this way, you are now in the transverse view. In the transverse view, this should be on this side and this should be on this side. On the transverse view, because you are the guest this is lying in front of you on the screen that will be the right of the guest and this will be the left to help you to localize structures and then in between the longitudinal and the transverse is oblique so now um what if the pointer sign has worn off or was not placed there are some older machines that don't have the sign to show you the correct orientation orientation is important because one of what we're doing here is not just basic obstetric scan, we're also trying to make sure it is safe. If you get the orientation wrong, a normally sided placenta, you can call it what? A placenta previa. And you can now make a wrong decision. Or a placenta previa, you can say it's normal, whatever. The guest goes for a normal labor and you now have a severe uh, intrapartum and postpartum hemorrhage and you know, other adverse outcomes. Now, if you cannot see the sign on the machine, put it on a transverse plane while you are scanning and just gently move to one side. If your image on the screen moves along the same plane like your probe, it means it is the wrong way. As you are moving it like this in a transverse form, it should be moving in the opposite direction. Once it moves, the image on the screen moves in the opposite direction, it means that this is the right side and you can now use it for your scanning. So as I said, there are a lot of, you can tilt your probe, rock and slide just to get a good focus on your images. Before you start the scan, you need a gel. This is the ultrasound transmission gel. You place it in between the body of your guest and the probe. What is its function? Is to remove air bubbles that will affect impedance, acoustic impedance, and prevent you from getting a good image. So always make sure the probe is applied first to get a good image of the procedure you are doing. So ultrasound in obstetrics. What is the use of ultrasound? There are three main uses. Of course, there are. There are different scans done at different times, but in a standard antenatal care, we usually do first trimester scan to date, to check the viability and the localization. Um, second trimester scan for, we use it for usually for the anomaly, and third trimester scan for placenta localization and fetal weight estimation. So we are now on the first trimester scan. Dr. Essen, if we're going to grade the, um, the period of pregnancy of 40 weeks, when is first trimester, when is second trimester, when is third trimester? Okay, so basically I think the most important is actually first trimester, which is from like about, should we say zero or four weeks? Because technically before 46 weeks, you can't actually see the gestational sac on an ultrasound, ultrasound except you're going in transvaginally 
So four to thirteen weeks. That's the um, first trimester, basically. Then the second trimester is thirteen to twenty-six, and the uh, from greater than twenty-six is the third trimester. Now, um, in the first trimester scan, what can we use? To do, we can use the transabdominal approach and the transvaginal approach. So um, the difference between the two is that the transabdominal scan requires a distended bladder. The bladder acts as an acoustic window, so sound will pass through the fluid in the bladder and be able to you be able to visualize the uterus and the sac within the uterus. And um, um, it is formed, is performed at the suprapubic level. While the transvaginal scan, I think, how do they perform it? Is it with a full bladder or empty bladder? No, you need to, the patient needs to empty, empty their the bladder. bladder. Yes. So uh, the transvaginal scan they will, is performed with the bladder empty. So you can see from this that it is more convenient. And as I mentioned earlier, the transvaginal scan gives more detail because it's more a high frequency scan. And so, because it's closer to the organ of interest, it's going to give you a better resolution. You can have an obese guest, and you just imagine that the sound waves will have to pass through the layer of adipose before it gets to the bladder and gets to the uterus. So if it's possible and you have the transvaginal scan in your facility, you should make use of it, especially in the first trimester. A few times, of course, in our own peculiar situation in Africa, because of uterine fibroids, you might not be able to see in, if you have huge lower uterine region fibroids, you may still have to use the transabdominal scan. But if you can, you can use that. So I, can, I just want to chip in. Like in cases where we have um, ectopic gestation, transvaginal scans are important because they could help to localize when you're going transabdominally, you may not see much, but if you go transvaginally, you'll be able to see the adnexa. So you can tell where exactly, if there's an ectopic, by the time you're seeing um, bleeding and all that, just going transvaginally, you'll be able to assess the ovaries, assess the adnexa properly and locate the ectopic. Okay, so um, thank you very much. As we go on, the gestational sac is the first thing we see. From the transvaginal scan, you can see it as early as five weeks. And um, when you don't see the embryo, what we use to date the pregnancy is the mean gestational sac diameter. And um, the mean gestational sac diameter, we get that by measuring the sac in three different planes. When we do that, we'll now get an average of the sac diameter, and that will now correspond to the setting, a certain gestational age of the embryo. Now, the embryo is seen by six weeks with cardiac activity, while the yolk sac is usually seen by around five weeks, five days onwards. So this is, uh, this is from, um, you, you can see here we can have, this is the endometrium, and we can see the intraditional, intradecidual sign of an early pregnancy. This uh, hypoechoic structure within the endometrial cavity. Here, you this is the sac again, and you now have what you call the double decidual sign, where you have endometrial cavity in between the two trophoblastic layers that surround the gestational sac. So now, when we see the embryo, can you see the embryo here? You can see the embryo on this side, right? Now, this is the gestational sac, and if you see this within the uterus, it shows that there is what an intrauterine pregnancy. I think we need to remind ourselves that pregnancy takes place in conception occurs in the fallopian tube, and the embryo now has to move into the uterus to implant. Once you are, you are scanning and you see a gestational sac, a yolk sac, and or an embryo within the uterine cavity, you can rest your mind that you have what? An intrauterine pregnancy. There are rare cases where you can have a combination of a intrauterine and an ectopic pregnancy called a heterotopic pregnancy, but they are very rare. Well, we've seen a couple in the years. Yes, so um, when, you, when you are seeing this now, the yolk sac, can you see this round on which is the yolk sac? 
it is actually in early pregnancy is meant to support the embryo, but it is not within the same sac as the embryo. The embryo is in the amniotic sac and the yolk sac is in the chorionic cavity. So if you look, sometimes you see a line separating the two of them, but around 12 to 14 weeks, they now merge together, the chorionic cavity and the amniotic cavity. So what do we do? How do we, now we have localized it that it is within the uterine cavity, which is one of the goals we want to achieve in our first trimester scan. The next thing is, how do we date it? Now, dating is important because the accuracy is best when in the first trimester. So the first trimester scan is the best scan to date a pregnancy. Usually when you are confused and you have a guest that has had so many scans and you're not sure of the EDD, try and fall back on the earliest scan which is done in the first trimester, which will give you a best, the best uh, whatever of the date. Usually the range is plus or minus three days of accuracy. And what you use to get it is what they call the crown rump length. If you look at the first, the image on your left, you can see that you cannot really know what is the crown and what is the rump of this. The rump is the buttock, the crown is the head. You just measure from one embryonic pole to the other embryonic pole. You put your caliper here and you put your caliper here. And that will give you the crown rump length and will give you the gestational age. Now, if it's a much older pregnancy, you could actually make out the head here, the cardiac activity in the abdomen, and you can see the rump here. You can see the lower limbs and the upper limbs, and you can actually say that this is the crown and this is the rump, but you measure from one end to the other. But always make sure you do not include the limbs in the measurement. And what else don't you include? The yolk sac. It may be near the yolk sac, but make sure the yolk sac is not included because it will give you a skewed reading. Um, I think just a word of caution too, because we're looking at the pitfalls. When you're doing additional sac diameter, a lot of times people scan from one side of the sac to the other side of the sac. One, one or two, but we, it, that is not the case. I'm going to do a mean where you take the values in the three planes and add them up and get, the machine will actually do it for you and give you a mean sac diameter. Don't use only one diameter to get your mean sac diameter. And when you are taking your mean sac diameter, don't put the echogenic circle around it inside of it. Just measure from the inner portion to the inner portion, the hypoechoic area. I think it's, it's quite well. So um, getting the crown run plane, getting the mean gestational sac diameter is very, very essential. However, we try to encourage by 12 weeks, you should not use this, the crown rump length again. The reason is that because by then the baby is now active and can actually flex or extend. It flexes, it gives you what? A smaller date than what it is. The extent gives you a longer date. So from that time on, we could use other parameters like the BPD and head circumference. And some people use the femoral length to get the dates from 12 weeks. So what else are we checking? Um, Dr. Essen, this image is showing what kind of modes are we seeing on this image? We're seeing two modes here. There's the B mode, which is on top, and the one below is called the M mode. The M stands for motion. The B stands for brightness. Now, when you want to get the cardiac activity of the embryo put the cursor you you click there's a there's a button on your ultrasound machine called the m button you click on it it brings out this caliper here you just put it right across where you can see the flicker of cardiac activity and then it gives you a tracing now from the tracing you can now freeze it and calculate from one to the other and it will automatically give you your heart rate. So it's advised to also document the heart rate, which shows that, which is a prognostic factor and shows that the guest, the embryo is doing well within the uterus. 
Now, what are the things we should look out for? That we are doing a first trimester scan and it looks like this pregnancy is not going to do well. There are some prognostic factors like if we see absent cardiac activity by the time you are seeing the embryo. However, it is described as a poor prognostic factor if it's less than 7 mm. You are seeing the embryonic pool less than 7 mm and you cannot see cardiac activity. It's a sign that something might be going on there. Another one is if you, you, you don't see an embryo and the sac, mean sac diameter, MSD stands for mean sac diameter between 16 to 24 millimeters. Just look at it because it is small, we're using millimeters. Don't confuse millimeters and centimeters. Now, also, if by a certain time you cannot see the embryo, like if you can see an embryo with a heartbeat seven to, seven to 13 days after ultrasound showed a gestational sac without a yolk sac, or earlier, seven to 10 days, if you see a yolk sac and yet you see, cannot see an embryo inside. And we need to check things like the morphology of the sac. How does the sac look? The amnion, the yolk sac. Sometimes you see empty amnion. What did we say was in the amnion? What structure? The embryo. The embryo is the one in the embryo. We'll see empty and you now see maybe an enlarged yolk sac. An enlarged yolk sac is the yolk sac diameter that is more than seven millimeters. And a small gestational sac in relation to the size of the embryo. That means if you measure the gestational sac and measure the embryo, the difference between them, that means the mean sac diameter minus the CRL. If it's less than a certain amount, which is five millimeters, then you say that there may be something wrong. It indicates a poor prognosis. Now, I mentioned about the contour of the gestational sac. And if you see a large yolk sac that is calcified, I think when we see the calcified, I think you will have like a bright spot within the yolk sac. That is what we call calcification within it. And that can show that likely the pregnancy might not be doing well. And um, so it's a poor prognostic yes, the poor prognostic factor. And when we do the heart rate, I think we mentioned the heart rate of less than 85 beats per minute, fetal bradycardia, and we check around chorionic villi. And there's something called Sometimes you have a guest coming with spotting PV, you check and you see what they call subchorionic yeah. hematoma, yeah. So usually it can happen, but a certain percentage of subchorionic hematoma, if it is more than two thirds of the sac circumference, is something we'll be looking at as, for, as a sign of poor prognosis. So let us go to some image, images, because we do it, it's good to see so that you get to learn this thing. What is, what is happening to the gestational sac? It's not looking smooth, so it's, irregular. it's looking irregular. That's what we're seeing here. Irregular gestional sac, which we say is one of the poor oh. prognostic factors. So it should be well-rounded. It should be well-rounded. So it's, it's, it, it may not on its own say something, but it gives you an indication that something might be going wrong. Now, this is the gestational sac. Can you see this yolk sac is large? Once it's larger than, what did we say, seven millimeters, it shows that um, something might be going wrong. And Dr. Essen, you can just um, use this and show them, use this mouse okay. and show them the calcified yolk sac. Okay, so that's the calcified yolk sac right there. Um, it's whiter than, I think that's basic terminology. It yes. looks whiter. And every other thing. Yes, which is happening. Then there's yeah. a light, if you can, because they if may you not can really appreciate, able to appreciate it. the um, yolk sac. Yeah, so this is the yolk sac, and this is the expanded amniotic cavity, which is also a poor water. So the yolk sac is enlarged, and yeah. then the, there's, a, um, there's a calcified yolk sac, sorry, and then there's also that enlargement going on there. Yes. So if you look also at the image on the right hand side, you will see that this is the sac. I can see all these areas, these echopenic areas around the sac. This is what we call subchorionic hematoma. A lady can be spotting and have that, but we are concerned about the area of affectation. If it's more than two thirds of the surface, it is also what a poor prognostic factor. So we said something else, hydropic change. That is all these cystic areas you see within the chorionic villi is also a poor prognostic factor. And if you can see, look at the image on the right. Can you see that the mean sac diameter and the crown rump length, it's so near each other. 
So when you have a small decisional sac, where you have the mid-sac diameter minus the crown rump length less than five millimeter, be careful. There's a term they use for it called first trimester oligohydramnios. So it is a poor prognostic factor, yeah. Another thing is if you're sending someone for an ultrasound, say around six weeks, and the person comes back and um, there's a sac, but there is no embryo, it shouldn't be in here. Most times I think there's an issue, there's a mistake that happens that sometimes they just rush in and say, okay, there's no embryo. So automatically it means that the pregnancy is not viable, which is not the case most times. Because even if we don't see an embryo at six weeks, it's still, it could still happen, it's still normal. Um, transabdominally. So you could request another um, scan within two weeks, which we usually put in our conclusion. We suggest a repeat scan in two weeks, and you should be able to see an embryo transabdominally by eight weeks. Thank you very much for that. So continuing, you can see here, we have this, what we call a chorionic bleb, and here sometimes the position, the, the embryo implants in the posterofundal portion of the uterine cavity. So if you see low down, low line digital sac, it could be a sign of poor prognosis. So I'll, I'll soon get to what we can definitely look at and say, this is a non-viable embryo because we have this problem, it's a, it's a dilemma for some people where to say that this pregnancy is not good because once you make that condition that this first trimester pregnancy is not going on. The next thing is to terminate the pregnancy. So you have to be really sure of what you are doing at this stage. I will tell you the criteria involved to say that the first trimester pregnancy is not going on. But first of all, we want to take one or two. Yes, so um, we have some questions from Georgiana. You can see the slides on the demonstration. Hopefully by now you should be able to see the demonstration and the images as well. Then the other question from Anonymous, does Limi Hospital carry out ultrasound training? Yes, we, we've done that in the past, but presently because of COVID-19, we are not doing that currently. So we will communicate to you. You can follow our um, Instagram, you can follow us on YouTube, and um, we'll communicate when we have our next ultrasound training. Okay, then um, we have other questions from, okay, all the people about audio. I think we've resolved that. Audio, then, okay. Please, if you if you cannot hear the audio well, you can just raise your hand and let's see whether you, you the audio quality is not clear to you. Thank okay. you. Okay. Then Dr. Sakari, you're asking about um, how do I recognize the uterus? How do I recognize the uterus? That's okay. The so um, as we said, first thing first is to be able to localize the urinary bladder which is the first thing you see when you have a distended bladder so you tell the lady to drink water so that the bladder is distended the purpose of a distended bladder is to push away bowel loops that can obscure the uterus below that and act as an acoustic window so once you have a full bladder the structure beneath the full bladder with the pear shape of the uterus is the uterus. And the uterus has three layers as we know, serosa, myometrium, and endometrium. So it should be clear, the issue, the, one of the pitfalls people have is that a guest, some guests are not patient. That's why if you have the transvaginal scan, it's good to use it because you tell them to drink water, they drink water, and maybe they drink water. You see, has to form urine, and it takes some time. They'll tell you maybe the next two to three minutes that their bladder is full, and you check. You need that full bladder to accurately visualize the uterus and to visualize the adnexion. So that will help a lot for you to see that. Thank you. And thank you. We have the transvaginal transducer in Limi Hospital because not all hospitals have that. So if you have a guest that doesn't have the time, you can actually request a transvaginal scan instead of a pelvic scan. Then we have two okay. more questions. So audio, some audio. Uh, I'm just gonna answer Okay, that. I think the audio can, yeah. okay, all right. Mr. Denga, an interesting lecture. I will appreciate the lecture I sent the email. We are not sending any lectures to email, please. What we are going to do is you can go to our YouTube. This lecture is going to be on our YouTube. So when, when, when we send your CME on the, on to your emails, we will put the link for the YouTube. So you can actually watch the repeat, it's been recorded. 
So you can watch everything we said on the YouTube channel okay. after. And then Thank Mr. you, Mr. Leke, you will be giving slides afterwards. I believe I've answered that question. I yes, I've you'll be giving question. it. Thank you very much. So yeah, I will continue now. So um, what are the features in keeping with non-viability? Now, you need to be certain of non-viability because if it was a viable embryo and you said it's not viable and they terminate the pregnancy, it is an iatrogenic death. So these are the things you should look at before you say the pregnancy is not progressing. Now, the first one, um, absent cardiac activity by the time the crown rump length is a setting size. Now, if you measure the crown rump length is greater than or equal to seven millimeters, seven millimeters is 0 0.7 centimeters. If you measure and you wait, please don't be in a hurry, wait, you will see that flicker of cardiac activity. If it is not there and you waited a while and you cannot see that flicker of cardiac, it's like a ticking clock at that stage. If you cannot see it and the embryo is greater than seven millimeters, you can say that that is a non-viable pregnancy, uh, which we call a missed abortion. Or oh, yes. So another one is if you have an absent embryo by the time the gestational sac is a certain size. You know, I told you you should use the mean sac diameter. Please remember that because a lot of times it is no more as the pregnancy progresses. It is no more a round structure. The gestational sac is oval shape. So if you take the short axis, you will not get a different reading than if you take the long axis. That's why you have to use this with the mean. Please remember, this is a pitfall we make mean sac diameter. If it is greater than or equals to 25 millimeters and you still cannot see the embryo, it shows that it is not viable. If a previous scan had not shown an embryo and you have looked at it and it's, there's no embryo with the sac, mean sac diameter of 2.5 cm, 25 millimeter or greater, you can say it is an unembryonic pregnancy. So um, now, if you say absent embryo, please, we need um, two ultrasound examinations that we mentioned, whatever. So we usually say if there's absence of embryo, they had be two or more weeks after ultrasound showed the gestational sac without a yolk sac, or you have absence of embryo and had be 11 days after the gestational sac showed the yolk sac. So two weeks after you see just the sac, you cannot see embryo with heartbeat. It's not viable. Two weeks, uh, 11 days, when you can see the sac and the yolk sac, and you cannot still see an embryo, it is not viable. Research has shown that it is very unlikely it will go on beyond that. It's just like the for what I was talking about, that um, uh, poor prognostic factor when I was talking about first trimester oligoidramnos. The research has shown about 94% of people that have that end up having a poor outcome in pregnancy. So this is an image I just want to show you. This is the uterus. For you looking out for the uterus, this is how the uterus looks like. This is the gestational sac. And you can see this is the embryo here. We now put the M mode. If you check your machine, you see M. M stands for motion. You put it at the level of the cardiac activity. And you can see here, there is no cardiac activity being seen here. This shows that it's absent. And you now measure. Remember, if it's less than seven millimeters, it is a poor prognostic factor, but you actually wait and say, let me rescan you on, an, on another day. But once you measure at a time and you have more than seven millimeters of the crown rump length and you cannot get cardiac activity, we'll say that it is not progressing. Okay, so we'll answer this question really quickly. From Raphael, if I, what are the possible contraindications to a transvaginal scan? So the number one contraindication will have to be if the person is a virgin. You can't do a transvaginal, you have to ask before you go in and insert your probe, you have to ask, are you sexually active? Except there are situations where you won't ask, maybe you see the patient is married, you don't need to ask because you know she is. But if a young girl, walks into your room and wants to do a transvaginal scan, you have to make sure that she's sexually active. 
I think that's the number one um, contraindication. You could do a translabial scan for someone that is not sexually active, right? That's okay, so um, what happens is that um, you, it's a case by case, whatever. First thing for any procedure is always have the guest consent. You explain it to the guest and say, this is what, what you have to do. If you are a male, you get a chaperone. And then you then, what is it called? You, you then um, make sure that um, the guest is whatever. And you use your safe um, techniques before you put it, put a condom or something to make sure that there is no infection. You're not bringing an infection. And earlier on, in, uh, later on in pregnancy, you are trying to make sure if you are suspecting a case of placenta preview and all of that, it might not be safe to use a transvaginal scan for that. So um, it is is based on a lot of things. Which it may not. This lecture may not cover the full scope of it now, but uh, we'll get to that later. Thank you. So if the mean sac diameter, remember I said you measure in different planes, and if it's greater than or equals to two point. 5 cm or 25 millimeters, and you still cannot see an embryo with cardiac activity, then it is not viable. So now, what other conditions do we see in first trimester scan? We see things like um, ectopic, extrauterine pregnancy. We see multiple pregnancy. We see, you can see uterine fibroids in pregnancy for our environment and um, you can see um, gestational trophoblastic disease, especially hydrogen mode. So um, for an extrauterine ectopic pregnancy, now the implantation of the fertilized ovum, if it occurs outside the usual location in the uterine cavity, it is regarded as an ectopic pregnancy. And um, the commonest site for an ectopic pregnancy is in the fallopian tube just after the fertilized ovum has occurred. And then I think the commonest site in the fallopian tube, of course, is the ampulla because of the wide portion. So ampulla is small, then less commonly the fimbria and coronal regions of the tube. Then rarely, in about 3%, you could have an ovarian ectopic pregnancy and a cervical ectopic or a scar ectopic. Risk factors for ectopic are pre in, in, uh, in vitro fertilization, previous ectopic, tuber surgery or injury, pelvic inflammatory disease, or an IUCD. So what do you usually see? Usually you see what? An empty uterine cavity. The woman is pregnant, pregnancy test is positive. She's maybe bleeding or she may not be bleeding or feeling dizzy. And you now look at the uterine cavity is empty. Even the sign may be ticking, but you cannot see a sign. Then you can see maybe a complex adnexia mass, or you can actually make out a gestational sac with an embryo with or without cardiac activity separate from the uterine cavity. And in cases where you have rupture or slowly leaking, you can actually see hemoperitoneum. So here we have a case of um, an ectopic pregnancy. Now, you remember what I said that when the bladder is full, the structure you see below it in that superbibi region is the uterus. Can you see the uterus? This is the fundus, this is the body going down to the lower uterine region to the cervix. Now, if you look at this uterine cavity, can you see that there's no sectional sac inside? And meanwhile, pregnancy test is positive. Woman is having lower abdominal pain, usually at one side and all of that. And here we do a transverse scan. Can you see that you can see a sac? separate from the uterus on the left-hand side. That's because, and I think this even had cardiac activity. It was actually having cardiac activity, but this is a left tubal ectopic pregnancy. So cavity is empty. You see a sac outside the uterine cavity, and then you could see um, other complications like um, hemoperitoneum, or you could see a complex mass and all of that. So that is that for it. And um, this is a case, usually this is the liver and this is the right kidney. This space is called the Morrison's pouch, what is called the subhepatic space. You should not see, it's a virtual space, but when there's fluid, you can now see fluid gathering here. And it's not that period, it's a fluid. And so it, sometimes you see low level echoes with this. All these are from hemoperitoneum from a ruptured ectopic pregnancy. I can see here in the anterior posterior cul-de-sac, can you all see fluid here? 
So these girls had massive hemoperitoneum with a ruptured ectopic pregnancy. So um, if it's possible, you can also confirm using a transvaginal scan if you have it in your facility. It makes your confidence more on diagnosis because you actually can see the endometrial cavity better and can see that the cavity is empty. So we move on to multiple pregnancies. So you can see it is good to define multiple pregnancy in the first trimester. The reason is that you need to see the chorionicity, the amnionicity, you understand, monozygotic, dizygotic, and all of that. And you can see this is monochorionic, monoamniotic, yeah, identical twins within this, yeah. So that's them, the yolk sac, the two embryos there. Then you can see these ones are in different sacs. Are you seeing them in different sacs? This was of a guest that, um, you know, these days there's some um, abuse of medication. The guest actually took um, clomiphene citrate on her own and now had this amount of pregnancy. What we are looking at is a quintuplet pregnancy. So, um, sorry. So the guest had five separate embryos within the uterine cavity. You can see all of them are within their own sacs there. That's it on this. And this one is a triplet pregnancy. They are all in their different sacs. So the first trimester is the best time to ascertain multiple pregnancy and to determine their chorionicity and myonicity. So another thing we see, especially in our environment, is uterine fibroids. And usually because of the hormonal input, uterine fibroids can degenerate in pregnancy because of all the progesterone and all of that. And usually you see cystic changes within them as we can see over here. The lady is complaining of pain, you check, the sac is fine, but now you can see, this is a degenerative uterine fibroid here. And we measured the uterine fibroid and it weighed three kg in the first trimester of this pregnancy. So it's weighing more than the baby. Yeah, it's weighing more than the baby. So look out for fibroids, especially the guests complaining of pain, especially in early first trimester pregnancy. Could be because, and you can see the sac here is a bit displaced inferiorly because of a fonder fibroid. So always look around. Don't just focus only on the sac. Look around because you can see other things. You could even see a large corpus luteum cyst because before the placenta is formed, a corpus luteum cyst from the ovary could is supporting the pregnancy and it could really increase in size and cause pain. So you should document on that too. Okay, so we have um, two questions. Uh, one from Ikechuko. Can a transabdominal scan show an ectopic pregnancy? That's the first one. What was the second question? The second question is how important is the transvaginal ultrasound in an ectopic diagnosis with PV bleeding? So let me just answer this. Okay, first let me question. I'll answer them. Don't okay. um, so um what is happening here is that if you look, I'm going to take you back. I'll take you back. This is not a transvaginal scan, this is a transabdominal scan, and you can see it is showing the ectopic pregnancy clearly. Please, um, we are not trying to say you should, you should still be able to make a lot of your diagnosis with the transabdominal scan. It's just that the transvaginal scan gives more clarity. If you have it, if, you, if they are supplying you a machine, insist on it because it solves a lot of your diagnostic issues. But if you have a transabdominal scan, you can still get to see it. The image I'm showing you now of the empty sac and a left adnexal gestational sac is from a transabdominal scan. So a transabdominal scan can show and make accurate diagnosis of an ectopic pregnancy. And when you put it on the transverse, this is the transverse I'm showing you like this. It makes it into, this part of the screen is the right, this is the left. You can use that to localize where it is in relation to the uterus, to know whether it's a right tubal ectopic or a left tubal ectopic. So, um, so the There's, question, yeah. How important is the So now, how important is the transvaginal scan in bleeding? Now, the truth about the transvaginal scan, don't be scared about, I told you that we're, we're a bit concerned in late pregnancy because of placenta previa, and we can do a translabial scan at that time. But 
But earlier on, please just remember that the, the transvaginal scan is in the vagina and not in the uterus. Ectopic pregnancies occurring usually in the tubes, in the peritoneum. The transvaginal scan is within the cavity of the vagina. So unless you have an open cervix that is big enough to allow a transvaginal probe to go through is us, you cannot possibly cause any damage by doing a transvaginal scan. So please don't be scared, but make sure you have adequate barrier because you can infect by not having adequate barrier on your probe and make sure you remove it without causing whatever so that you don't whatever, that is it. But bleeding is not a barrier to using a transvaginal scan. So um, this is um, a displaced IUCD. Can you see the pregnancy within the uterus? And you can see, and you, and you, you can see the IUCD here in the lower uterine region here. So the displaced IUCD is what allowed for this pregnancy to go ahead. So a woman comes to you, she's pregnant. Meanwhile, she says she had an IUCD um, before inside. Sometimes it's good to locate it and let the obstetrician uh, know about that there's a displaced IUCD along with the pregnancy. So you, you can have this molar pregnancy complete um, Partial, and you can see this is the characteristic experience, experience where we see snow tom pattern in the uterus. So, before I move to the second and third trimester scan, I want to ask if there's any questions or any. Okay, I believe we've answered most of the questions. There's just one last question from Olu Chuko. Please talk about identification in ultrasound or monochorionic and diagnostic. You actually missed that. I don't know if you want to go back. Um, monochorionic within the same that, but they have. I don't know. I remember I told you one time that amnion is where the embryo is, chorion is the where the yolk sac is. So if you see only one yolk sac, where do you understand? And you can see the amnion are different where the embryo is inside. You say that is diamniotic, monochorionic, they share the same chorionic cavity. I told you in early pregnancy, there are two different cavities, amniotic cavity, chorionic cavity. They merge from around the 12 to 14 weeks to form a single cavity. So you can actually see the difference. There's a thin line that separates them, which makes you to be able to assess it well. Thank you. So um, I'll be moving on to the second and third trimester scans. And um, one thing we want to get from the second and third trimester scan, as I mentioned, um, whatever, second trimester scan is usually done and a lot of the time you are checking out for anomalies on the scan. Yeah, you want to make sure that all the organs form well and all of that. And third trimester, you're looking for the placenta localization, the presentation of the, of the head, and you're looking for the amniotic fluid volume, the estimated fetal weight and all of that. And usually for second and third trimester, we use biometric measurements, four commonly used biometric measurements to get the estimated fetal weight and estimated additional age. And they are the bipareta diameter. Remember that bipareta between the two pareta bones, diameter, single measurement. Then you have the head circumference. Head circumference is you get the circumference of the entire head. And then you have the abdominal circumference, still circumference, and then you have the femoral length. So this is where you measure, this is the landmark for measuring both the head circumference and the bipyramidal diameter. You can see here the inverted arrow. Are you seeing that? In the region of, this is the fac cerebri, this is the thalamus. This is the best position to get your bipyramidal diameter and your head circumference. Now, the truth about it is that the charts that give you the weights and the age depend a lot on the landmark you use. So if you beam up higher or lower than this particular landmark, you may get a different reading, which may affect the accuracy of your, of your scan. 
So make sure you are at this point. Where, can you see the perimeter bone here? So for the bipedal diameter, you start from inner to outer, or from outer, that is where the bone is, to the inner portion here. Once it is a single measurement straight down, and that's your bipedal diameter. Then for the head circumference, the same way you come from here to here, and you now open up with your track ball on the machine, and you measure the whole thing here, and you now get the head circumference. So the bipedal diameter and the head circumference are measured at the same plane. Unlike the bipedal diameter, I said the bipedal diameter is from where? Inner, to outer, outer, or outer, outer to, to inner. inner. While we're talking of inner to outer, this is outer going to inner. I see my arrow outer going to inner, or from inner here going to outer. But for the head circumference, you measure outer to outer. You encompass the whole skull in the measurement. Please remember that because it helps you to be consistent. Because a lot of obstetrician and gynecologists use your scanning to monitor progress of the gestational age and the weight and all of that. And so it's important to get your landmarks well. So um, this second one now is for the abdominal circumference. You know, I told you still landmarks. Make sure you get the whatever, when you get it in a longitudinal view like this, till, till, till you can get the abdomen in a round circular fashion like this. When you get in a round circular fashion, beam up or down till you can see this dark appearance of the stomach. This is the umbilical vein, portal, the umbilical vein junction with the portal vein. And these three white structures you can see here is the spine. You can see the annotated diagram here. Are you seeing it? Stomach, umbilical portal vein junction is like a J. Can you see that junction? Like a J shape there. Then you can see the vertebral body. So it is at this plane you now measure you now measure the abdominal circumference, like the head circumference, outer to outer. So what you do, just remember this: don't get scared. You put your caliper at one end, then put it to the second end, then then just open it up. It will now cover the entire place. And once you click set, it gives you your abdominal circumference. So how many have we measured out of the three? Out of the out of the no, we have, meant, we have talked about okay, three. three okay. We have talked about the bi-perimeter diameter, head circumference, and abdominal circumference. Okay. So that leaves one last one there, and that last one is the femoral length. Now, why is the femoral length important? To know something. Remember our topic is pitfalls. You could actually measure the humeral length instead of the femoral length. People do it and wonder why there's so much disparity in their whatever. Always make sure you are at the femur before you measure the femur length. There is a cheat code to it to know how to get the femur length. When you are scanning, locate the head. Come down, you will see the cardiac activity. You will see the heart within the chest. The bones beside the ribs and the heart is the upper limb, which is the humerus. So come down on the, on the baby, and you will see that you get, you leave the stomach and you get lower down to where you can see the urinary bladder. At that lower down area, if you just rock your probe side to side, you will see a small white structure, which is the bone. Once you expand it, rock it one way or the other way, it will now open up fully for you like this, and you can now measure the femoral length. So the technique is to make sure you are lower down in the fetus so that you can, you can make sure you get the femur and not the humerus, and then you can now get the femoral length measuring from one end of the bone to the other end. So another pitfall is getting measuring the tibia instead of the femur. How will you know is the tibia, not the femur you are measuring? Because sometimes the baby's leg can be folded and you could be seeing the femur and the tibia and all the bones just beside each other. How will you know? The tibia and fibula are together. Yes, so she has just given you perfect answer. 
beam around it. Once you see two bones, two whitey structures side by side, it cannot be the femur. Are you understanding me? The femur is the only bone of the thigh. So once you see two bones, even if the other bone is looking like the femur, it's likely the tibia you are measuring. There are, of course, for research and some other things, they can measure tibia, but for our commonly used parameters, the femur length we use single bone near the lower region, next to the adjacent to the urinary bladder, you will get it. So, can we take one or two questions? Okay. So, they don't pile up. so um, we have a question from Emmanuel. Is it possible to notice fetal movements without seeing, cardiac, fetal, seeing the fetal cardiac activity? That's the first one. Um, when you are doing a scan, I'm sure what you are talking about is the first trimester scan. So, uh, because um, you can notice the, the, the embryo moves, it moves up and down, but you are not seeing the cardiac activity. Motion is a sign of life. Once you see motion, it means there's cardiac activity. Now, the issue now is that motion will affect because first of all, know that when you scan, you are, it's represented on a two-dimensional screen. Your scanning monitor is a two-dimensional screen, but it's measuring, it is looking at a three-dimensional image. What it just goes to show is that you are not at the plane of the heart. Tilt the probe a bit, wait a bit, you will see the cardiac activity. You will just see it is not big, it is ticking like a clock. You're not going to see the fully formed four chambered heart in first trimester. You just see a ticking thing which represents the cardiac activity. But motion is already telling you there is cardiac activity. It is not possible to see motion and not see cardiac activity. A cheat of doing it to know when you're having difficulty in seeing cardiac activity, there's a button on your ultrasound machine called depth, D-E-P-T-H. Zoom in so you get a larger view of the embryo. Sometimes we just leave it there and we, we don't zoom in. When you zoom in, you see it becomes clearer and you are likely to see the cardiac activity. And it's very important to see the cardiac activity because even if you're thinking, you're assuming you saw motion, it may, it may just be the mother's movement, the mother's breathing movement that is making it appear that there's some motion going on there. And then there are instances, in fact, I think as a last week, there was a scan I did that um, the gestational age was accurate. It was, it's correlated with our last period but there was no cardiac activity. So obviously, whatever had happened had just happened recently, either maybe the day before or so. We went in and did the transvaginal scan again and confirmed that there was no cardiac activity. So I think cardiac activity is very important. Um, so the other question from Matthew, sometimes I see fetal hearts not distinct from abdominal cavity. How do I solve this when scanning? I think you've answered. Okay, so, so what, what should happen is that, see, there are different planes in when you are checking it. So what you should do, open up the image. Sometimes, why is not this thing? Because you are seeing it in a whatever. So you could, if, if you can look at my probe now, if you see the whatever, just, if you are seeing the cardiac activity, it means you are around the region of the chest. Just where you are, beam down or beam up you get to see the abdomen without the cardiac activity. Always make sure when you're taking the abdominal circumference, you are not seeing the beating heart because it shows that you are not in the abdomen. You are in between the chest and the abdomen and your, your, your parameters will not be accurate. Make sure it is just the abdomen you are seeing without the beating heart being seen in that plane. It's just for you to adjust. It is not a camera. It is based on your manipulation, you can get the perfect image. So always make sure that you are patient and you do the right motions to get it and make sure that the cardiac activity the, is not, the fetal heartbeat is not in your plane when you are measuring the abdominal circumference. Okay. Let's take the last question before yes. we continue. From Raph for the head circumference, since the head is not round, tracing and elliptical, which is preferable? Um, we preferably tracing, manual tracing has its own complication because you may not be able to trace it accurately. So when you freeze, most machines have the automatic um, elliptical where you put the caliper at one end, 
the same plane you did your bipyrical diameter, put it at one end, put it at the second one, and just use the track ball to open it up. You will get the you get what you are looking for. If you don't get it the first time, try a second time, and most times you get an accurate measurement. It just takes sometimes the idea is that you will not get it at one view. Now, this is another thing you need to learn with your obstetric scan. Sometimes you get the right view, but as you're about to measure, what happens? The baby moves or something happens, you don't want to, immediately you see that press freeze. Now, when you freeze your image, there's a what they call a signing loop. The last few images of your scan in are saved on the system automatically. So once you press freeze, you now use your trackball to take you back to the, the correct plane that you saw you wanted to take your measurement at. Then you can just press your calculator, whatever, and now take your, your measurement at that point so that you don't say that, ah, I saw it as I was about to do it, it moved again. Then you start looking again. And remember that the guests are lying on their back. They cannot stay on the back for too long because it, the weight of the fetus is going to be compressing on the aorta, which is delivering blood to the placenta. So we are trying to make the scan as fast as possible to and as convenient for the patient, even as we try to get our accurate measurements. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So um, other things we look at in second and try to measure scan is the placenta. We look for the grading of placenta localization of placenta, abrupt shape placenta, and hemorrhage, and the placenta thickness. The normal thickness is usually two to four cm. You measure perpendicular and make sure you get it well. Placenta could be enlarged in things like, um, if you have um, things like uh, gestational diabetes mellitus, which goes along with uh, polyhydramas. Now the grading of the placenta, you've heard so much about placenta grade and you're wondering why is it so complex? There are three, there are four grades, grade zero, grade one, grade two, and grade three. It is not always the case that you get to a grade three placenta in a normal pregnancy. So for most of first and second trimester, it will be grade zero and grade one, and most of second to third trimester will be grade one and grade two. However, grade three placenta is important to note if it is early, like 25, 26, we are already seeing a grade three placenta it might mean that there's some form of intrauterine growth restriction or something wrong with the, with the baby that you need to pay more attention to. And how you know the grading is just, when you look at the grade zero, it's just smooth, chorionic plate, no calcification is seen. Why, when you go to the grade one, you now see some calcifications, basal calcification, and just some tiny specks of calcification scattered within the placental tissue and subtle integration of the chorionic plate. Now, when you have larger basal and comma-like uh, calcifications, right? And you now have integration of the chorionic plate like this is a grade two placenta. And in a grade three, which is a mature placenta, you can see there's a definition all the way. There's complete integration of the, uh, the chorionic plate. So you can see like cotyledon is separate, separate, separate. That's what I saying in a grade three placenta. And you see profuse, basal calcifications and calcification even within the, the substance of the placenta. This is an example of a grade three. Can you see you can separate this segment from this segment from this segment. You can see this line goes all the way, all the way um, separating them. I can see that. Can you see the obvious basal calcification there? I see obvious basal calcification. I can see the scattered calcifications all around. This is what you see in a mature placenta, a grade three placenta, but usually you should not see this kind of thing in like a 20, 24 week old uh, fetus. When you see it, it raises concern, but generally the idea of the significance of grading of placenta, it is a controversial issue. So um, now we have what we call placenta previa. It is also going the placenta before the age of viability, we call it I think low-lying low placenta. So you can't see a first trimester and call it placenta previa. It's a low-lying placenta. It's important to know about low-lying placenta too because it could be the cause of um, spotting PV. A woman comes, she was spotting, you may just do the scan and find out the placenta is low and that is why it's, it's causing it. 
Now, in grade one placenta previa, it is low, maybe about 0 0.5 to 5 centimeters from the internal os, and grade two, it just reaches the internal os but does not cover it. Grade three, which is partial, covers the intern partially covers the internal os, and grade four completes it, completely covers the internal os. In this case, where you are suspecting this high level of placenta, please, we try as much as we to do a translabia, we stay at the labia, we don't go in so that you don't cause issues by going in to do a transvaginal scan when you're suspecting placenta previa. And you can see what kind of placenta is this? What grade? This grade four. This grade four. You can see it's completely covering the internal cervical os. You can see the head there. So let's imagine labor was going to take place. This head is going to try and pass through this placenta to come out. And of course, you can imagine the kind of hemorrhage and everything that will occur. These are the reasons why we should all have an idea of an obstetric scan. You can be the only one in labor room. The woman is bleeding all of a sudden. Labor is not progressing. And then you just put your probe, you see the fetal head. This is a cephalic presentation. The head is facing down. And you just see the placenta right in front of the way out, the internal cervical is completely covered. This is a grade four placenta preview. You immediately inform the consultant uh, obstetrician that see, I have a grade four placenta preview. I don't think we'll have a good outcome if we continue a transvaginal delivery. Please, we need to prepare for an emergency cesarean section. Our hope anyway is that this is detected in antenatal, routine antenatal scans before you get to see this in the labor world. So uh, it is it is it is not remember I said for the dating better to use the earlier scans, first trimester scans, but you usually when you are seeing a post-dated baby, you you see most times you get to see a mature grade three placenta. It just tries to give an, it sort of like tells, when you write the grade three placenta, the obstetrician is looking at it and saying, ah, this is something that I have to do something on time and I, I should not wait too long. When part of the thing you can do in that kind of thing is to do like an obstetric Doppler scan. We check the umbilical artery Doppler, you try to Doppler and see well, how good is the perfusion still coming from the placenta. So in that case, you see a grade three placenta post dated, you can please send for an urgent um, fetal Doppler, obstetric Doppler ultrasound and see whether there's already um, fetal placenta vascular insufficiency and know when to act based on the Doppler indices. Okay. Okay, all right. So you could also have abruptio placenta, which of course when like you just have a, a the spiral artery just suddenly ruptures and because of the bleeding that takes place, it just separates the placenta from the wall. And what you have, if you look here, you can see that this is how echogenic the placenta is. You can see this dark area here. This is ritual placenta bleeding from an abruptio that just occurred. So the woman comes, severe pain or some, a few times without pain and you just, so apart from looking at the, the fetus, always look at the placenta. You could just discover a huge, um, hemorrhage from abruptio, and this could now be a lifesaver. And you, they can act, you reach a period where they can do uh, intensive care, they can actually intervene to try and save both the mother and the child. Another thing we check is the amniotic fluid volume. Now, commonly for amniotic fluid volume, we use what we call eyeball assessment. Eyeball assessment means that you just look at it and it just looks as if there's fluid. Like what I was telling you about um, in first trimester, you have a and when the sac and the embryo are not looking so different from each other, but looking at it, you just notice that there's fluid. That's what people commonly use. I want to just say that amniotic fluid is normal. The volume is adequate. But to be more scientific about it, you can, there are two other things you can use. We call the deepest vertical pocket. You measure from one side to the other end and if it's less than two centimeters, you can think of oligohydramnos. It's greater than eight to 10 centimeters, you think of poly. Poly means plenty, polyhydramnos. Oligo means lower. But in our environment in Nigeria, we do more what they call amniotic fluid index. 
The amniotic fluid index is measuring the amniotic fluid volume in four different quadrants. You take the woman, measure on the, on the uh, right lower quadrant, right upper quadrant of the, uh, of the gestational sac, upper and lower. And then you should get a value when you add them, the machine usually adds it for you between eight to 24 centimeters. Less than eight, we say is oligohydramnose. Better than 24 centimeters, we say is polyhydramnose. So um, when you are measuring it, what is the pitfall people make when measuring the amniotic fluid index in those quadrants? What should you avoid? When you are doing that, you must avoid making sure there's no fetal part or umbilical cord in your measurement. Please always note that. Let me show you one. Can you see this? Can you see the fetal part is away from the measurement? It is a perpendicular measure. Perpendicular means from top to bottom. If there's umbilical cord in it, don't use that area. Move to where you can just see just the amniotic fluid alone without fetal part or umbilical cord. And that's what you use to take your measurement vertically, top to bottom. This is what is for deepest maximum vertical pocket. This one is showing like polyhydramnos because from this you can get it. They measure they are getting 14 centimeters. Now, can you see this one? This is what we call amniotic fluid in there. Can you see that they are taking in different quadrants? Yes. One, four two, three, four, four different quadrants. But what do you notice about it? Can you see that they are avoiding all the structures? Who can see the feet showing up here? Can you see the fetal feet here? Can you see that they avoided it? They were, so they just take in the different quadrants without uh, whatever. And that's what you use, you add together and get the amniotic fluid index. So when it's less than eight centimeter, what do we refer it to? Polyhydramnos. Greater than 24 centimeter, we call it? Polyhydramnos. Poly okay. Well, sometimes when we see the when the when it's 10 that's when we are seeing it's 8 cm there about less than 8 cm and the pregnancy is already 10 is this something that we should still be doing well the idea is to usually when it's near 10 the the obstetricians want to know what is the fluid saying all these things will guide how long they can wait for spontaneous labor to occur so it's good for us to still me mention it and let the obstetrician make their decision on what they want to do based on what we're getting. And sometimes you could have a women that drain like up. So whenever you have, always remember we have, we have a history of drainage of like up. Don't forget to do your amniotic fluid index because it is used also not to just me me uh, measure the fluid level at that particular time. It helps to for serial monitoring. You can now know, is it going down? Because the woman probably will be on bed rest. Is it improving? This helps for them to make decisions on what next they have to do about the pregnancy. So we'll just take one or two questions if there are any before we continue. Okay. Um, okay, so We've answered this question, Dr. Sapere, about um, getting the recording and slides for the lectures. Do okay. Okay. So um, you, um, we are we are corresponding with you through your email. We are sending your CME. We are sending the slides of this presentation, and we are sending the YouTube link for this video. All of them will be sent to your email that you use to register for this lecture. So please don't worry about it. If you joined later, the previous part, you can watch it on the YouTube link. The slides also will be available. And then also your CME points will come to you via the email too. Okay. Thank you very so much. So final question, what are we to do with the four quadrants? Is it divide, addition, or multiply? Okay, okay. So what happens is that, why I didn't talk about that is that um, usually the machines, once you start measuring, the machine show you, if you look at this place, you can see they, they put Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4. The machine actually adds it up for you. It is an addition. It is an addition. It is not a multiplication, it is an addition. So sometimes you can have, a, not all machines are the same. Some will not add it for you. So once you measure them one by one, you add them all together. So in some cases you now see so much fluid, what they call polyhydramnose, 
you now see that the baby's weight, when you take all those correct vibration measurements is large, then you now see that the placenta might be greater than four cm in thickness. Immediately you are wondering what is happening here. Is the mother diabetic? Should we do an OGTT for her to check for additional diabetes? Or is there an anomaly or something wrong? So those are the things we can also check. But it's an addition. We do it's an addition of a different quadrant that gives us the amniotic fluid index. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, so part of our second and third trimester scan is that we look out for congenital anomalies too. So I'll just basically run through a few. There are a lot of um, congenital anomalies and all of that. And usually we are doing a basic, this is a basic obstetric scan just to make you practice safe and effective scanning for to help us intervene and reduce maternal mortality. When you want to, you can now refer to um, a radiologist in, in, in your center or a skilled um, sonographer, radiographer to do the anomaly scan, which shows some things that could be wrong. You, in your normal basic scan, you'll be seeing some things that can be wrong in the scan. Like you see oligohydramnos, polyhydramnos, the abdominal circumference cannot measure it well. Something other. When you see all those things, and there may be a history of not using your folic acid, and the woman is old, all these pointers, you can now say, okay, let us do an anomaly scan. So, that, so I'll just quickly run through the various um, anomaly, so a few anomalies that we have seen in our center here, and then um, it will just stimulate you. You can ask questions and all of that. So. If you look here, this is the abdominal circumference here. But if you notice, can you see this where these green arrows are? The abdominal circumference has henated from the normal area outside into the cavity, but it is still surrounded by its membrane. Now we put a, a color Doppler. We can see blood vessels within the liver, which is outside the abdominal cavity. This is an anomaly that you can see. And when it is covered by a membrane around the umbilical area, we call this kind of anomaly omphalose. Um, if it is not covered by a membrane and is not from the umbilical region, and you just see intestine and those things outside, we call it gastroschisis. So this is what, this is not from our place, but I'm just putting somewhere to show you. You see it's covered by a membrane with things inside. So it is minor when it's just bowel content, but what we saw in our own case is major, where you have the liver tenating through the abdominal cavity. Now, if you look at this scan, you can see it's a twin pregnancy, right? You can have, you see one head and you can see the second head. What do you notice in this second head? Can you see this score? Have you seen the score here? And the brain can you see that this second twin doesn't have a skull you can just see the membrane of you can just see the brain tissue but no skull in it when you see it like that it is a lack of formation of the skull which is called a crania so um this is what we see here you can see that no skull here all we see is the brain tissue, exposed brain tissue here. It's called the cranium. This is how it looks like when you see it in, in, in the screen. In the, when the baby is born, that's how it looks like, without the fetal skull. Now, these are two twins. So they have the same decisional age. But can you notice that one head is bigger than the other head? Are you seeing that? Now, if you see this head, can you see the normal brain tissue? But here, can you see the facts? in the middle. And what do you see here? Hypoechoic area, which is just fluid that you can see there, which is hydrocephalus. So you can see this is it here. This is, so one side of head is bigger than the other side of head. So with this now, if you tell the, the doctor that you are seeing hydrocephalus, it will be difficult to, with the size of this head, to try and attempt a vaginal delivery. I you now have to look for an alternative way to deliver. 
So this is what happens. The brain tissue has been compressed to the side and what you just see is fluid within where the brain tissue should be. Now, if you look at this other one, I'm not showing one or two other, this is the head circumference and this is the femoral length. The femoral length, if you look at this, is showing 34 weeks and the head circumference is showing 25 weeks. So what do you think is happening here? What is happening here is that it's as if the head is smaller than, much smaller than the femoral length. And you could have this in what you have in microcephaly. This is how it should be normally. And when the head is small, this is how it would turn. That child had microcephaly. This is another case here. If you look well, can you see the hand? You can see the head and you can see the body. Now, can you see a structure at the back here? Here we cannot see the skull, we cannot see the brain at all. Here we can see a structure in the neck. This is a cystic hygroma. Not just a cystic hygroma, there is also lack of brain, which is what we call an encephaly. We presented this at um, the American Institute of Ultrasound in Medicine Conference in New York, 2020. And the YouTube link is available on the screen there. You can look at it and you can read more about it. It is a rare thing where you find an encephaly with cystic hygroma. So um, generally, these are the basic things you need to know, the techniques, the pitfalls, and the basic things you need to know for a basic obstetric scan. Um, we partner with Leading Edge Ultrasound Institute. I think sometime in the beginning of June, they will be organizing ultrasound trainings. You could uh, contact the Leading Edge Institute and apply if you want to have this basic training because it's one thing to say, it's another thing to have a, two, a little bit of hands-on experience. But what I want you to remember here is that don't take all these things we have mentioned here for granted. Follow them and you practice safe obstetric scan. So at this point, I want to take one or two more questions you may have before we come to a close of this webinar. Okay, the next question we have is from Kristen. When is the best time during the second or third trimester to do an anomaly obstetric scan? Okay, that's a good question. So usually anomaly scans are done between 18 to 24 weeks. But basically, it doesn't mean you cannot do it much later than that. But usually it is done between 18 to 24 weeks. But however, if you still suspect, and you know, you, it's not always a lady presents to you from first trimester. You could just meet an unbooked guest at 28 weeks. And there are a lot of risk factors, elderly, previous uh, anomaly, previous Down syndrome, previous uh, did not use uh, folic acid and all those things in first try, not use antenatal drugs, not do this. You are thinking of all of that. You can also go ahead and steal whatever, but it's better earlier. Okay, so the next question is from Eleanor. Which parameters are most accurate in relation to GA or trimester? We answered that before. Okay, so okay, so the crown rump length is the most accurate, up to 12 weeks. Now, above 12 weeks, the most accurate is BPD head circumference. And if you can't use that, you can use the femoral length. But however, for full biometric measurements from second and third trimester, we use the four together. However, as you go on in pregnancy, the range changes. If you check your machines, it will show you first trimester, we use CRA, it gives you plus or minus three, plus or minus four, plus or minus five days. Then when you enter second trimester, it gives you plus or minus one week. And by the third trimester, is plus or minus two weeks. The reason for that, why you should know is that if you have a big for age baby, because it's the biometric measurements we are using for the dating, a big for age baby will appear older than his age, right? Now, a small for age baby, even though it is of that age, because the biometric measurements are less, will appear smaller than its age. It's just like when you are born, you and, um, let's say, a basketballer like uh, LeBron James, people were not different much in height. 
But as you grew now, he's now six foot something, you are now five foot or whatever. Over time, it's the same thing in pregnancy. In the period of crown up length, first trimester, the we are everybody's around the same time and the ages are more accurate. But as you pregnancy progresses and different things happen to different um, fetuses, you expect some variation. So usually what we see in third trimester, we use a plus or minus two weeks for it for dating. So try and explain to your guests too, because a lot of them hold on to your dates. Explain to them that third trimester dates are not reliable as early first trimester dates. So I think the problem we have is education. The guests are not educated or not quoting on strongly to that particular date. I always remember that um, term is what? 37 to 40, 41 completed weeks. So basically there's not a particular delivery date. It's just a guide. Just remember that and it will help you. Okay, so I believe we've been answering the questions along the line. So we've answered almost all of the questions so far. So anybody that has questions, I noticed that some people are raising hands. Please, we will appreciate if you send in the messages as opposed to raising your hands. Okay, so, so, questions so, um, so um, I, I hope um, it's been, um, it's been very beneficial for you. You've gained a lot from this uh, brief uh, webinar session we've had. The idea is that you should be able to handle a probe, look at things and make uh, whatever. And remember things we said about M mode, knowing the, the right side of the probe, pulling it on the screen to make sure it goes away from you and not in the same direction as you to know and where to know where is the top, where is the bottom, how to have a full bladder when you are doing a transabdominal and the bladder should be empty when you are doing a transvagina, looking for other things, not just the baby alone, the placenta, the fluid volume and all of that. So all of this together helps to give us better outcomes because we're interested in better outcomes and that's what we practice. That's the vision we practice in the Limi Hospital groups, which comprise of the Limi Hospital in Central Area, Cardio Care, Cardiovascular Specialty Hospital in Gariki Area 11, and um, our Limi Children's Hospital. We try to create these webinars and so many things to change the healthcare outcomes in the country. We have our specialized neonatal intensive care unit in the children's hospital. We have an ambulance, transport ambulance that can pick up a baby from wherever it's delivered and take to our NICU. We also have a, our specialized cardiovascular branch where we do things like cardiac catheterization and we're able to put in um, cardiac devices and pacemakers. And in the um, Limi Hospital um, Central Area, we engage in multiple specialties in dermatology, ENT, obstetric and gynecology, and so many other specialties. So if you feel free to refer to us as a, as a center, if you need whatever, and we do our best and we give you feedback on what we have done with your guests and what and what we uh, could help. So um, it's the idea, the goal behind it is to create healthcare that each of us, if we could play our own part, will make healthcare better. What makes healthcare better is not just the equipment, but the people. As we get better, as we improve ourselves, we'll know that the outcomes will improve and nobody needs to engage in medical tourism if these things are available, which are available here. Thank you very much. Okay, so the final question from Oluchuku, asking any branches in Lagos? <laughs> For now, no branch in Lagos, but over time, of course, we will have that too over there. Um, Lagos is the economic capital of the country. so. But generally, we hope we can reach you through our webinar series. We do it regularly and we communicate to you. So you'll be getting our emails on webinar. And we have so many interesting topics on different things from pediatrics to cardiology to also, there are so many exciting things. And what we try to do, we are not trying to create high highfalutin things, basic things that you can use and improve the outcome for your guest. We want it that wherever you are, you are giving good safe medicine and the guests are getting better thank you very much thank you very wonderful thank you thank you dr essen thank you very much yeah. all right thank you
Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a nice weekend.